Good morning, everyone, and God bless you, and wonderful to see you. We are entering into another portion. We're taking another break from the Book of Romans. Yes, again. Um, uh, just uh, it seems to be timely. We we run a series every year titled the May Day series, and it's uh, it's an interesting name. May Day usually stands for an emergency or something to be warned about, something to uh, to call out for and to cry out for as a, a potential danger approaching. Usually it's an ominous sign. Um, and we do it in May. I just figured it fit. So the series is on prophecy. It's teaching about that which one in four verses of the Bible teach on. One in four verses, more than a quarter of the Bible is prophetic. And it's a real shame that when we have more than a quarter of the Bible as being prophetic, that there are so few pastors that teach anything on prophecy. And that's really sad. And you wonder how it can possibly be that they would consider themselves preaching the entire counsel of God. It might seem strange to you that we could actually know um, ideas about the future. Um, it might seem strange for you to think that God has actually chosen to reveal those things to, to us, that we might be able to know the things that are coming ahead. And indeed, much of the Bible has prophecies that were already fulfilled in the past. And we know that those prophecies that were fulfilled in the past can also be encouraging to help us understand and see how the prophecies will be fulfilled yet, yet future. It's interesting, you know, because within each one of us, we seem to have this desire to know the future. It's almost like it's built in. We have a desire to know what the future holds. And, and there, are, um, there are those who will attempt unlawful means to discover what the future has in store for them. They're going to look into the things that God has strictly forbidden. Uh, they're going to be looking at products of devils and not of God. And these means are a lot more dangerous than any of the people who indulges uh, have any awareness of but some have attended to it by lawful means they've they've looked at the world and they've considered all the information that they have at their disposal and they've looked at the events that are going on in the world and they've looked at them logically and they've simply drawn a straight line they've looked at it and they said well this is where we are right now and if nothing changes in the course of events, this is where we're going to be in the future. And they simply draw a straight line. This is done through wisdom, through education and understanding and through seeking of those things that they can actually see happening in the world. And, you know, um, we tune into them, don't we? We sit there saying that, oh, no, you know, pastors shouldn't be teaching on prophecy. And yet every time you turn on the news and you're listening to an economist, what do you think you're listening to? Every time you turn on the news and run at the end, it's the weather forecaster, you know? So it's, you know, I mean, again, what are they doing? They're, they're, they're teaching things by lawful means, not unlawful means. Both of these means, however, are completely imperfect at best and devilishly deceptive at worst. Neither can give any person any degree of certainty or comfort, n n not even the weather forecaster, all right? Not even the weather forecast. I've, I've, I've often made that statement. If they can get tomorrow right, then I'll believe them for the next 100 years. Until they can get tomorrow pretty much bang on and they, they, they're still hit and miss, you know. I was expecting a really nice sunny day and it rained. You know, it's, those sort of things are annoying. The Bible is no such source. The Bible is nothing like these imperfect means of being able to know that which is yet future. The Bible is a book that contains 66 books. It was penned by at least 40 different individuals. It was done so over a period of 1,600 years. It was written in three different languages, written on three different continents in the world, and yet it comes together and it tells one complete story, one uncontradictory story, one that is perfect in its in its whole and it's perfect in its nature and within this is a story that simply can be summarized it deals with man's greatest problem and God's perfect solution 
It deals with man's greatest problem in God's perfect solution. The problem of sin and its wages and the solution of salvation and eternal life. It's been said that on the page of every book, on the pages, on every page of the Bible, it's the Lord Jesus Christ who is represented. He's represented on every one and that makes perfect sense because the Psalms in Psalm 47 says, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. And this is of the Christ that would come. And Jesus on the Emmaus road, he actually testified to the same thing. When he was speaking to those men who were traveling on that road after he had risen from the dead. You remember the account? They're walking and they're sad. They're having communications one with another and they're sad. They're one of the disciples of the Lord. And as they're communicating, Jesus comes in amongst them and he asks them what these communications are that they're having and they're sad. And they speak about Jesus of Nazareth, how he was he that we had hope of Israel and all these great things have have come to pass. And in the last three days and they've gone to the grave and he's not there. And Jesus actually rebuked them. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Every part of the Bible, we see Christ. We see his character represented there. We see his nature represented there. We see how he's dealing with the nations represented in the text of of scripture. We see Christ. So the Bible is not like the best guess of the most educated person in the world concerning things that are yet future. And it's certainly nothing to be compared to the, the multitude of demonically inspired clairvoyants that fill our astrology columns every single week, whether it's in the newspapers or in the magazines. The Bible is perfectly accurate concerning everything that it has written of. Perfectly accurate. Of all the prophecies in the Bible that have already been fulfilled, this is the important key. Of all the prophecies that the Bible has already put Put forward that have been fulfilled, all of them have been fulfilled literally, not allegorically, not subjectively, not figuratively. They have all been fulfilled literally. When the Bible foretold that Jesus would be born of a virgin, how is it fulfilled? It was fulfilled literally. When the Bible foretold that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem hundreds of years earlier, it was fulfilled literally. When the Bible foretold that he would be crucified more than 600 years before the invention of crucifixion as an execution tool, it was fulfilled literally. When he had said that he would die for our sins, it was fulfilled literally. When it was said that he'd be in the grave for three days and three days only and then rise and so it came to pass. How did it come to pass? It came to pass literally. When it was said that he'd be taken up in a cloud to God So it happened with a multitude of witnesses who had seen it come to pass literally. So if the prophecies concerning Jesus' first coming were fulfilled literally and two-thirds of the prophecies concerning Christ are related to his second coming, how can we expect them to be fulfilled? To me, I figure, you know, it was literal. You know, just, I'm just going to put it out there. I just reckon that if the past is an example of the future, then everything concerning Christ, as it's told in the scriptures, is going to come about literally, not figuratively. You know what's exciting about that? It's exciting because you guys have all got the book and you can actually open its pages and guess what? You can know what it actually says because it's literal. It's not subject to your personal feelings or, 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 or thoughts about things. It's literal. Now, if you don't like what it says, that's something else. And that's the problem that we've got. The contrast to what a lot of people teach and believe with regards to the prophecies of the Bible, it's not that it's difficult to know. It's not that it's difficult to know. It's just that it's often difficult to accept. And that's the problem. That's the problem had a wonderful conversation with, with Julie the other week and, and she was talking about how I was talking about prophecy and amazed that I would even touch on the subject. You know, it's such a, you know, it's such a taboo subject in, in so many ways. And it is. 
in most modern churches, it is. It's a taboo subject. You don't, you don't touch prophecy because no one can know, you know. And we, we hear of it, you know, we hear about the things with regards to the rapture of the church, you know, that it's, some say it's pre-tribulational, others post-tribulational, some that it's mid-tribulational, pre-wrath, and others that it's pan, pan-tribulational. What's pan? It'll pan out, you know. Or somehow in their mind that the idea about when the, the, the catching up of the saints is going to happen is not important. And therefore, it shouldn't be discussed or spoken about. And, you know, I, I still think I've got a real problem with that. I've got a real problem with Satan wants us to not teach any element of what the Bible actually says. And I think he's created an incredible, perfect amount of confusion within modern Christianity today. The May Day series this year has its focus on one thing, and that is the imminence of the return of Christ. The title of the series is simply called Imminent imminent yes it's about the rapture of the church but it's only about one element of the rapture of the church and that is that it can literally occur at any time there are no signs that precede it there are no events that need to go before it it is to be waited for with anticipation you'll see that in those texts in the new, in the um in your newsletter you'll see all these elements as you're looking at those elements within those passages and i can't remember how many at least about 15 or 20 different passages. There's no signs that, pre that precede it, no, e no events that need to go before it. It's expected to happen with anticipation. We are with expectation, with hope. It's imminent and it encourages us in our trials. It brings comfort. It motivates us to share the gospel with others. It exhorts us, exhorts us to live lives that are godly and it excites us to live for the purpose for which we have been created. It excites us to live for him, not for ourselves. Because we have no idea when the time is going to come. No, no, you, you can't go and borrow hundreds of thousands of dollars thinking that you're not going to be here to pay it. It's not how this works, okay? It's not how this works. Because we don't know the day nor the hour. We have no idea when it's going to come to pass. There are quotes that I can give you with regards to John Calvin. John Calvin actually thought that all the tribulation had already passed and now we're waiting imminently for the Lord's return. And that was in John Calvin's day. That's a while ago. That's a while ago. I'm sorry, we're still waiting. You know, But just because we're waiting, it doesn't mean that it's not coming. And this is the exciting thing about it as well, is reading a book... On, on this topic by an individual who was sort of saying that, you know, we shouldn't be looking for signs and wonders because the rapture of the church happens without any signs and wonders. And he says, that's a big no-no. Well, but at the same time, if you know that it's pre-tribulational and you know that what the world is going to look like during that tribulational portion of history, if you know what the world's going to look like and you're actually seeing things unfold in this world that's going to manifest itself in that time you know that it's coming closer and closer and closer we don't know it, it can happen before i finish the sermon this morning oh how cool would that be hey the communion we had this morning we can have it this other you know that'll be really good jesus can come at any moment and it's something that the bible instructs us to watch for to talk about to tell of and as we see the unfolding events around the world, bringing the prophecies that are in the Bible to life. It's exciting to see. We know that the time of our being caught up is so much nearer now than when we first believed. And that's what's exciting about it. The imminency of the return of Christ for his church has been the most exciting anticipated event in the history of the church until these days until these days where strangely strangely there are too many that mock and that say where is the promise of his coming you know what's really interesting about this because prior to 1948 there were very very few you look at the things that are going on in the world and there were very few ideas very few pictures of prophecy sort of being fulfilled there were very few and you they, they were happening but they were happening very very slowly Big events were happening slowly. 1948, you recall what happened in 1948? We have the Balfour Declaration in 1917, which promised a portion of the land to Israel. 
1948 was when Israel became a nation, born in a day, just as the scriptures promised. And that all of a sudden became the focal point because, you know, we have um, the Schofield Reference Bible. Schofield Reference Bible was written, I think it was at the turn of the century, somewhere around the turn of the century, the 20th century. And um, Schofield actually spoke about Israel being in the land. He goes, I don't know when this is going to happen. I don't know if it's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to happen. There's no sign of it yet, but I just know that it is. Israel is going to be back in the land, you know, and that was written well before 1948. And what happens? 1948, Israel became a nation. Since then, slowly, slowly, other prophecies are being fulfilled. Large ones are being fulfilled. And they're coming about so quickly now that there are, there are programs and you can get them on YouTube. Almost on a daily basis, there is more and more evidence showing this is happening over here, this is happening over here, this is happening over here, this is happening over here. All these different things, they, they speak about a convergence of events in the world that is all coming to prove the scriptures true. Interesting, isn't it? Happening quicker and quicker. Do you notice that? What does the Bible say with regards to the last days? What are they like? Birth pangs. They're like a woman in travail, the Bible says. How does a woman have travail? Well, they begin slowly at first, don't they? But then they become a little bit more frequent, but also with greater intensity. Yes? And this is exactly what we're seeing happening today. The time is not yet. Yet the birth pangs are definitely there. Now that's for the time of the end. It comes to the rapture of the church. That can happen at any moment. What is the rapture? Just real quick. To be honest, it's the weirdest event that I've ever read about in the Bible. It's this strange event where those who have already died in Christ, their bodies in the grave, and those who are alive are going to be caught up, changed. The Bible refers to it as in the twinkling of an eye. They're going to be changed. They're going to be caught up. And they're going to meet the Lord together in the air and ever be with the Lord. It's a time where Christian believers are going to receive instantly their resurrection bodies. They will be immediately changed. It means that we won't be here. We're going to be caught up. Is that weird? I reckon it's weird. Okay. Um, it's interesting when you understand science and you understand the, the, the atomic structure of the atom and you understand that we're all made of atoms, and yet atoms themselves are, a, are, are an electric manifestation. They're a, they've got a nucleus, and they, you know, it's 100,000 times bigger as the outside of the, of the shell, and in between there's basically nothing, you know, just electrons spinning around. And that's what we're made of. That's what this pulpit's made of, the Bible's made of, this iPad's made of, you know. There's probably more atoms in this iPad than in me. But the reality is, something is going to change. God knows how it's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to happen. All I know is that the Bible teaches that we are going to be caught up. Has it happened before? Yeah, it's happened before. It's happened heaps of times in Scripture. We see that in the Old Testament with Enoch. We see exactly the same thing in the Old Testament with regards to Elisha. He was taken up in a, in a, in a chariot. Elijah, he was taken up in a chariot. We see the same thing with Paul in the book of Acts. He was, uh, he was, he was caught up into the seventh heaven, he, he says. We see also in the book of Acts, Philip the Apostle Philip, or the Evangelist Philip, who was caught away, all right? It's the same word that's in there that we use for the word rapture. It's the word rapture in the Bible. Well, if you read Latin, yes. If you read English, no. But in the Latin, it's there. It's exactly the same word. The Greek is that word, hapazo. In the English, we have the word simply being caught up. So it is there. This morning's sermon has this focus on the imminency of the Lord's return and we see it in an incredibly unique position within the New Testament and it's in here in the Gospel of John. And I want you to consider it with me this morning and we're briefly going to go, going to go through this. It's simply, the title of the sermon is simply, Where I am, there ye may be. Where I am, there ye may be. John chapter 14, first three verses is all we're going to be focusing on. John 14, verses 1 to 3. Jesus speaking here in the first verse, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. 
I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for this time this morning. And I pray, dear Lord, that you would be a blessing to us, that you would encourage us, strengthen us in our faith and help us glorify your wonderful name as we consider this passage. Be with us, dear Lord. Let the wonderful truth of the scriptures warm our hearts and fill us with excitement. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Comfort from trouble. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. There's something very, very unique here with regards to this account. And what it is, is that it's in the Gospel of John. John isn't like Matthew, Mark and Luke. It doesn't form part of what's known as the synoptic gospels. Matthew, Mark and Luke are known as synoptic gospels. They're synonymous one with another. They're very, very similar accounts. Almost all the accounts are filtered within them. There's just the details. Many of the details are different. The Gospel of John stands apart, separate. It's, not, it's one of the gospel accounts, but it's not one of the synoptic gospels. And what's incredible is that in this particular passage, Jesus is speaking about something that's a little bit different. It's not quite what we see in Matthew, Mark and Luke. Matthew presents Jesus as the promised king. He he presents him as the fulfillment of all Old Testament prophecy. So if you look at at the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, look at it in that light and you'll help and it'll help you understand how Matthew plays itself out. Matthew focuses on Jesus the king. He is the one that inherits the throne of Israel. Mark is different. Mark presents the Lord Jesus Christ as the suffering servant. He he quickly moves from one event of Jesus to another event. He quickly moves from one act to another act. He is the servant. He's doing the work of God. Luke, different again. Luke presents the Lord Jesus Christ as the man, as the man. It presents Jesus in all his humanity. Luke's account is the only account that actually shows us Jesus at the age of 12, right? That's not in any other account. That's only in the Gospel of Luke. Luke is the one that actually presents Jesus Christ as bleeding for our salvation, as, as his blood that, 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 that cleanses us from sin. That's found in the Gospel of Luke. Luke, we see a genealogy, genealogical account that is a little bit different from, from Matthew's. It's the same but different. It goes all the way back to Adam in the Gospel of Luke as the first man, Jesus the second, presenting the book of Romans as true when it speaks about him being the uh, the second Adam. And it presents it as his line coming down through Mary, his mother. So Luke, again, different. These accounts are all synonymous one with another, but they present the Lord Jesus Christ from different accounts. Each of them, however, have their account of the end of the world. Each of them have their account of the end of the world. In Matthew, it's chapter 24. In Mark, it's chapter 13. In Luke, it's chapter 21. Those three accounts in each of those chapters are very similar, one with another. The Gospel of John doesn't have that. It doesn't have that. It doesn't have that scene. It doesn't have this discussion about the end of the world. Jesus, in those accounts, is speaking to the nation of Israel. Church hadn't been formed yet. So when you're looking at Matthew 24, don't look at that as a rapture of the church or anything like that or the events for the church. It is strictly speaking to the nation of Israel. And here, this unique spot here, Jesus makes the most fascinating statement. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, ye may be also. This perfectly fits with other passages that speaks of the return of Jesus Christ specifically for his church to receive them. That where he is, they may be also. Not where we are, there he may be also. You got it? So not where we are, there he may be. Where he is, there we may be. All right? Very different. But it's only different if you accept it literally. There are no warnings to run for the hills. There are no warnings 
to not t- go into your house and take this or take that. There are no woes against women who might be um, who might be ready to bear children. None of that finds itself there. There are no no discourse on wars or rumours of wars in this. There's no plagues, there's no pestilence, there's no famines, there's no earthquakes in diverse places, there's no false Christs or deceptions in this passage. All of those are found in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. They're all found there, but not here. Not here. This is a very different event. Very different event. It doesn't make any appearance in this context. And we see it in the context, the chapter before this, we have the Last Supper presented. The chapter after us, after this is to encourage his disciples to instruct them and to live godly in the Lord. So there's nothing within scope of the context that speaks about the last day's events in this portion. Yet, I come to receive you to myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. The incredible portion and incredibly strange. What's he talking about? In, in John 13, Jesus was speaking about God being glorified, but he mentioned something interesting. You're in 14, turn back one chapter to 13. In the first chapter, in, in the first verse of chapter 14, remember he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Why is he concerned that their hearts might be troubled? In John chapter 13, verses 32 and 33. Oh, just on verse 33, have a look at verse 33. He says, little children, yet a little while am I with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you. Peter himself was troubled by this saying, and he questioned Jesus on it. But Jesus referred, uh, um, reaffirmed this in verse 36. Whether I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter, again, desiring Christ, he promised even to lay down his life for the Lord Jesus Christ. And those, those infamous words that he actually pronounced to the Lord. And yet Jesus says to him in verse 38, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Oh, just, those, just those words alone really sometimes get to me because... I look at Peter and I look at him in the New Testament. And yeah, we, a, lot, a lot of the times we like to make fun of Peter, you know. You know, we, we refer to him as, you know, you know, ready, fire, aim, Peter, you know. Uh, that he, he, he'll, he, he's, he's so impulsive. Um, he'll, you know, oh, that's the Lord. And he strips off everything and jumps in the water to swim towards the Lord who's on the, who's on the beach, who's on the shore. You know, not thinking that maybe the boat could get in there faster. No, he just jumps in. So, and he, he's a lot like that. But one of the things that we cannot talk against Peter is his passion, his trust, his belief in Christ. He's holding to the Lord with everything that is in him. He loved the Lord so bold enough to actually proclaim that he would never, he would die with Christ. But he denies him three times. It's one of the very few accounts that are found in all of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John have this testimony. And it gives you the understanding that he had shared this with everyone. He'd spoken to everybody. I did this to my Lord. And he said that I would do it. And I did it. You know, they seen the Lord Jesus they had been with him. They talked with him. First John 1.1, 1, 1, he says, That which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. And it's quite something else when, you know, he's not readily apparent. Yet yeah, we love him. Yeah, we haven't seen him. We haven't touched him. We haven't handled him. We've trusted him in his word. We've sensed him as a presence within us. You know, this is a joy that we have. So we know that the Lord is and we know that he is also going to be coming and that's the only thing that we can trust in. We knew that he would not leave us comfortless. He said that when he goes, he will bring his Holy Spirit and he will be our comforter. The Holy Spirit is known as our comforter. 
And we see this here. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Consider the infinite value of just this testimony. This alone is reason to be able to present to anybody that Jesus was making himself God. He was claiming that he is God. You believe in God? Believe also in me. You believe in God? You trust in him with all authority, with all power, with all understanding, with all your mind, with all your faith? Believe also in me. This, this equality that Jesus was having with regards to God the Father. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Well, what was he doing? What was he, what, what was he setting up for us? Well, he was setting up the preparation of a dwelling place. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. This is incredible consideration. Jesus is going to prepare a place, to prepare a place for you and I. My father's house are many mansions. I love the word mansions. I don't have a mansion. You go to Taylor's Lakes, there's a lot of Mick mansions. Sort of wonder, you know, in the ancient times, yes, the word mansion does mean dwelling place. That's what it refers to. It simply refers to a dwelling place. It doesn't necessarily refer to some big ornate thing. But just the fact that it actually come down to us today that we interpret mansions as something wonderful, something grand, something ornate, perhaps gives us a little bit of a picture that maybe there's a definite hint of that when it comes to heaven. I, I can't see that the Lord is going to be limited for space there. But then again, I don't know what space is in eternity. Space is a product of creation. <laughs> so where it fits within eternity, I've got no idea. In the province of Galilee, the place where Jesus began his ministry and where his disciples lived, there was an ancient custom of courtship and marriage. It was one where the bride was chosen and if she accepted her betrothed husband, a series of events would then begin to take fold. The husband would return to his father's home and begin to prepare a place for his bride. This was the surest indication that if he went to prepare a place, he would come again. He would come again to receive her to himself. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. The Galilean fishermen and the Galilean townsmen who became his disciples knew exactly what he was talking about because this is part of their custom. It's an ancient custom, but the uniqueness of that custom is, is specific to the province of Galilee. It's an Arabian custom. It's known as a custom in the Middle East. But there is some specificity within the Galilean one that is very, very unique. And they are these. They are these. We see something interesting, first of all, in the scriptures that it speaks about the church as the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was John the Baptist who was the first one to demonstrate this analogy. He says in John chapter 3, actually turn back there, John chapter 3, you can have a look for yourself. John chapter 3, two verses there, verses 28 and 29. They've come to him and asking him if he is the Christ. And he says in verse 28, Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. Is he referring to? Well, he's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, who's the bride. Well, we know he's the bridegroom. Well, this is an interesting thing that he says here, but you see the link. You see that there's a link. There's something more. And this is the unique part about it with regards to this, um, 
with regards to this Galilean setting. So what happens is the groom has chosen his bride. The bride then will either accept or reject the groom. There's a, there's a tradition that goes where the broom, groom offers to the bride the cup. He offers the cup, cup of wine to the bride. It's at that specific point where all the power is in the hands of the bride. The completeness and the fullness of choice is now in her hands where she can either accept the cup or reject it, push it away. Once she pushes that cup away, there is no more recourse as far as the groom is concerned. He no longer pursues the bride. That's very interesting. This is part of that tradition. But once she accepts the cup and she drinks of it together with him, then it is sealed. That marriage, that union is effectively they are betrothed, they are sealed. And then something else happens which is really interesting and it only happened in the province of Galilee as far as my research was concerned. And that is that he goes away, he prepares the house, he prepares a mansion, he goes to his father's place. But the problem is that she's got no idea when he's coming back. He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't tell her when he's going to be returning. Um, she's got no idea. She is to expect him imminently. Imminently. She's to expect the return of the groom imminently. Any time he can come back. And we've got the account of that in the scriptures when it comes to the, the ten bridesmaids. You remember that? Well, the ten bridesmaids, what happened with them? Five were foolish in Matthew chapter 25. Five had not brought oil for their lamps. And when they were gone to get the oil, what happened? The Lord returned. The, the, the husband returned. The, the groom returned. And when he returned, he took his bride and the doors were shut, Scripture says. It's exactly the same with regards to the wedding feast. At that time, the groom would return. And an imminent time, we don't know when it's going to happen. Traditionally then it happened usually in the darkness of night, right, where he would return. When they didn't expect it, when they least expected it, on the day and an hour that they thought not, that was when he came. So what hour do you think he's coming? Not that hour. <laughs> he would return, he would take his bride and immediately take him home and that is when the wedding feast would begin. They would be sharing in that wedding feast, I'll let you have a guess for how long? Seven days. They have a wedding feast for seven days and then the groom returns with his bride. You think that's curious? But what have we got in the scriptures? We've got something very unique in the Bible with regards to that. Now, we don't know the day nor the hour. We don't know the timing of the Lord's coming for his church. But there's something very fascinating about it. It can happen imminently. And then when we are taken, we are taken with the Lord into heaven. The wedding feast between the bride and the groom is taking place there. Between the church and Christ has taken place there. How long are we there for? Well, we don't really know. We don't really know because we don't exactly know the timing between the rapture of the church and the beginning of the tribulation, right? But we do know that we return after the wedding feast. And what do we see within the scriptures? The church comes back with Christ to rule and reign on the earth. It's an incredible picture and we see this in the tradition of the Galilean wedding. And this is what we see here. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. You want to see what the kingdom of heaven is like? Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22. Now, when we say the kingdom of heaven, I want you to understand something. that This is a description of the world at this time with the church in the world. Okay, and it's the preparation here is for the kingdom of heaven. And have a look at this account. Matthew chapter 22. I'm actually going to read those 14 verses that are there and you can get a picture of this. Matthew 22, 1 to 14. 
And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. And he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it. And they went their ways, one to his farm and another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burnt up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready. But they that were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid them to the marriage, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. The king is the father, and the son is Christ. The bride is the church. The wedding feast is the appointed time of the father, and the bride will enter her chambers, and the doors will be shut. Those who were bidden to enter, but would not, will remain to endure a time of horror that will come upon the earth. This is the time when the Lord will come out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their sin. And believe me, have a look at Isaiah. Turn to Isaiah chapter 26, a fascinating portion in the Old Testament concerning something very intriguing that is worth considering. Isaiah chapter 26 in your Bibles, right in the middle of the book of Psalms. If you hit it, turn right. And I pass the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and Isaiah. If you hit Jeremiah, you've gone too far, turn back. All right, Isaiah 26. Ready? We've got verse 20 we're going to be having a look at. Verse 20 and 21. Have a look what he says here. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Clearly, chambers are not the earth, are they? The chambers are distinct from the earth. They're not on the earth because the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth. But what's he doing? He's calling his people to come and to hide themselves into the chambers, to shut the doors about them. For how long? Well, while the indignation of the earth is overpassed. What on earth is that talking about? Beloved, if there's a consistency in what we understand about what the Bible teaches with regards to the rapture of the church... We have to see this perfectly fit, that picture. That the rapture is taken up, we are taken up, caught up, imminently at any moment, when he calls, when the trumpet sounds, and we are to hide ourselves in the chambers for a portion of time. How long? Well, at least until the indignation on the earth be overpassed. What's going on on the earth? There's a punishment on the earth by who? Satan? No! This is the ridiculous thing about these post-tribulational ideas, they think that the wrath that's being poured out on the earth is one of Satan. It's not Satan. Satan's doing his business now. You know, there's no wrath of Satan in the Bible. You don't see that in the scriptures. There's no judgment of Satan in the scriptures. Satan, Satan himself is poised for judgment himself. You know, can he give us grief? You bet he can give us grief. Does he give us grief? Yep, he does give us grief. You know, but we know, we know his wiles, we know his deceptions, we know what he does. Until the indignation of the earth be overpassed. There's another portion that I want to show you that promises to keep 
a certain people away from the trouble, turn to the last book of the Bible, Revelation. The book of Revelation. Not Revelations. It's not Revelations. Right? It's Revelation, singular. Revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 3. This is one of the churches that received their report card from the Lord. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David. He that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say that they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Notice, notice. I will also keep thee from the temptation, the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell where? On the earth. Again, a curious phrase. Because if the Philadelphian church was on the earth at that time, they would be included in that group. There's a distinction that's being carried out here. The word from is the one that's taken out from. It's not one that's kept apart or separated. This isn't, this isn't like... This isn't like the, 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 the Israelites in Egypt who were st- sitting in Goshen while God was pouring out all his plagues upon the land of Egypt, right? The Philadelphian church is not on the earth. It's not on the earth. It's all that dwell upon the earth, the inhabitants of the earth. And you see that distinction many, many times in the New Testament, which speaks about those that dwell on the earth, earth dwellers, essentially. But those that are in heaven are not on the earth and they are kept from that hour of temptation. Our gathering together in John 14 says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, you believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I come to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place, I will come again to receive you to myself. There's a, there's a gathering. There's a gathering. The, the you is plural. We know that. We, we read the old King James Bible, mate. It's just so hard to read. I don't know. I, I find it really easy to read. But the interesting thing that's fascinating about it, it is that it is very, very, very accurate. It is perfectly accurate. And that is why we use it. That's why we employ it. The word thou is a singular pronoun. It's a singular second person pronoun. The word you is a plural second person pronoun. You got it? So if I was to say, um, you are of your father the devil, you cannot turn to your partner and say he's talking to you, sweetheart. No, because I'm speaking to all. Okay? But if I said, thou, thou art of your father the devil, then I'm speaking to you individually, personally. You got it? So every time you see you, ye, um, yours, anything like that, understand that it's a plural pronoun. Thee, thy, thy, thine, that's all singular, okay? Well, we've shared that before, but that's what's really, really important to be able to understand. I go to prepare a place for you, plural. It's for all those who have trusted in Christ. Turn your Bibles to First Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Paul writing to the Thessalonians in his first letter. 
they have a concern at this time because they feel as if that something's, something's occurred that, uh, that they're concerned about for their brethren who have died before the coming of the Lord. They're concerned because the Lord hasn't come yet. That's just, just, I just want to put that out there. That's what they're concerned about. Jesus hasn't come yet, but our brethren have died. We're waiting for the Lord. We're waiting for the Lord at any moment, but our brethren have died and he hasn't come. What's going to happen now? That's the backdrop. Now understand what Paul is answering here. Verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Stop, pause, just one second. Prevent. It's the old-fashioned word. It's how, it's how it was rendered originally, literally. Prevent. Go before. Got it? It meant go before. That's what it always meant. It didn't mean to hinder, to hold back. All right? It meant prevent, which is literally go before or before go. Okay? Prevent them which are asleep. So in other words, we shall not go before them which are asleep. Verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. There's that word. Rapture. Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words. It's speaking about the rapture of the church. We are to comfort one another with these words. I'll talk more about that passage in, in some messages to come. I don't want to spoil it here. But there is a gathering there is a gathering of believers, those who are dead in Christ and those who are alive, those who know the Lord and are right now asleep. I love how the scriptures use that reference in the New Testament. Not even the disciples knew what the Lord was referring to when he said sleep. It was Jesus who actually mentioned that the first time. They sleep in Jesus, you know, but they're not, they're not, they're not dead because he uses his words very, very carefully. They're asleep in the Lord Jesus Christ. They are in heaven, their souls are in heaven, but there's some sort of disconnection. Their, their bodies aren't with them. We don't know what they appear like. We don't know what they, what they look like. You know, um, First John, John says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the sons of God. He goes on and says, We are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is right so we don't know what we're going to be appearing like but we we know that we're going to be like him the bible here talks about a gathering a mass gathering every single believer in the lord is going to be caught up and those that sleep are going to be caught up first it says we will not prevent them we will not go before them then we which are alive will be taken up with the lord to ever be with the lord this is an incredible thing that's happening turn your bibles to first corinthians 15 1 Corinthians 15. As we work towards winding this message up this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51. And we'll read to 58. Let's have a look and see what mystery is being unveiled here by Paul. First Corinthians chapter 15. You got it? All right, verse 51 is where we're taking our text. Behold, I show you a mystery. I show you a mystery. Verse 51. You know what a mystery is? <laughs> a mystery is something that was hidden, but is now being revealed. A mystery is something that was never seen before, never known of before, never heard of before, never even conceived of before. But now it's being revealed. I show you 
a mystery. I'm revealing something that was never before known, never before seen. This is something new. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. What on earth is that talking about? We shall not all sleep. In other words, we're not all going to die, but we will all be changed. What's that talking about? This is an incredible curiosity, this. We shall not all sleep, we won't all die, but we shall all be changed. There's going to be a transformation, a transformation in our bodies. A complete transformation is going to happen. And verse 52, how long is it going to take? He says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead in and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Vitally important here, vitally important because there's an incredible amount of confusion that happens with people that have uh, diverse views with respect to the tribulation and the rapture of the church. The last trump. It's not the last trumpet. A trumpet is the instrument. A trump is the sound that the instrument makes. We got that understanding? They're really, really important because you're going to be reading other documents and I'll be bringing some of them out to you, how people deny the pre-tribulation or rapture of the church because it's, you know, it's the last trumpet. But the trumpet is in Revelation and the trumpet judgments are in Revelation. No, it's not the trumpets. This is the last trump. This is the trump of God that's spoken about earlier. It's the sound that the trumpet makes. All right? There's a distinction between those two. Always be careful with respect to that. The trumpet shall sound, the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. And then he goes on and he says, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Why? Because the Bible says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So this, this mortal, our flesh and our blood is corruptible, but this corruptible must put on incorruption. We must be changed. We must be transformed. So then this, so when this, verse 54, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is something that we are to be excited about. There's a change. There's a transformation. We're not all going to sleep. We're not all going to sleep. Is that exciting? Um, You know, I don't know. I'm I'm not sure what it's going to feel like dying. But at the same time, there's an excitement with respect to this imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he can indeed come back at any moment. Let me close on this one verse And it's in Revelation chapter 22. Have a look in Revelation chapter 22. Revelation 22. Should be able to find it pretty easy. It's the last chapter of the Bible. And we're looking at the last five verses. Verse 17, and the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him that heareth say, come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this Of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Surely I come quickly. I don't, usually get into the, I don't usually get into the Greek, but this one's a curious one. The word for quickly 
is the same word that underpins our word that we have for tachometer, tachos. It's a rev meter and it's a revving up. It's an, in, it's an understanding that we get from this that when things begin to happen, they begin quickly. They will rev up. And this links in also perfectly with the idea of birth pangs, that the birth pangs come first slowly and then increasing frequency and severity and they move on. They happen quickly. And that's the impression that we get from this. We know that the last days that the Bible speaks about began when Jesus ascended. That's the beginning of the last days because this is the mystery of the church that's fitted into this, this history, this timeline. And the church is a mystery, and we'll talk about that in the, in, in, in the next messages that you'll be able to understand why it is and how we can see that this is the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church was never meant to be here according to the Old Testament. It's a complete mystery. But these things begin to happen, they begin and they move quickly. We have an opportunity to continue to look for the Lord's return, to grow in our love for him, to grow in our knowledge of him, to be burdened for the souls of the lost, to, to, to not find ourselves worried about the pitiful things of this life and of this world, to start putting priorities in their proper order and in their proper perspective, that we won't waste time on the futile things of this life, but that we will continue to put things that are more important and of more infinite value before us. And that's what you will want to invest your time in, beloved. You do not want to invest your time in the things that are going to pass away. We've got to do some of that work. I recognise that. But invest your time in that which is going to endure forever. Because the Lord's he's coming back. He's going to prepare a place for you. And if he's going to prepare a place, he's also going to return. And he's going to receive you to himself. That where he is, you may be also. That's what we're looking forward to. His imminent return. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for the word of the living God. We thank you for its truth. We ask you, dear Lord, that you would help us, Father, to expect you at any moment and that we may wait for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this time and ask you, dear Lord, watch over us. And if you should tarry, dear Lord, indeed, I pray to your Father, please, help us live godly in Christ Jesus. Help us also, Father, encourage one another to continue to look for you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.